Contrary to popular belief, BizTalk does not expect that it will always be processing XML data. Matter of fact, it does not even expect that it will always be processing text data. Some applications may very well need to pass binary data to BizTalk for processing. And BizTalk is perfectly happy to route those messages. You just need to design your application accordingly. Now I say all that, but it is true that if you convert your application's data to XML and you provide a schema that describes the format of that data, you will be able to take advantage of a greater number of features that come in the box with BizTalk. So with that in mind, let's see what BizTalk offers to help us describe our messages. In this module, we'll be talking about what BizTalk expects for a message schema and how it makes use of those schemas. BizTalk schemas are based on the XML schema format, but it also makes use of XML annotations to extend the schema format, allowing us to describe the format of flat files and EDI documents. Once we have some sense of how BizTalk uses these schemas, I'll show you how to use the tools that it provides to create and edit schemas. In this first lesson, we'll focus on the fundamentals of XML and XML schemas. And then we'll take a few minutes to look at the syntax of XML namespaces. And that's a very useful thing to understand when you're working with BizTalk. And then from there, we'll be able to start talking about how BizTalk makes use of these schemas to help us develop integration solutions. Okay, well, let's start off by reviewing some of the XML-related terminology that we'll encounter as we go through this course. First of all, there's XML itself. And it can be tempting to just dismiss XML as text with markup. And the spec is just a set of text formatting rules. Taking that view for the moment, isn't it pretty interesting that we're integrating enterprise systems with text formats? On the other hand, when you consider the history of enterprise and system integration prior to XML, it's not a pretty picture. So hey, if text with markup is what everyone can agree on, maybe it's not so bad. It really doesn't take too much study of the background of XML, though, to realize that there's a lot more to it than text with markup. XML is really about structuring and describing data in a standardized way, and that's what makes it so powerful. Now, I'm going to assume that you have seen an XML document before, but if you haven't, not to worry. You will have seen many of them by the time you reach the end of this course. But there is one thing that I'd like to note about XML syntax, and that is that XML element and attribute names are case sensitive. Now there is certainly a lot more to XML than just elements and attributes, but we'll talk about those topics as we have a need for them throughout the course. One thing that was lacking in the original XML spec was support for namespaces. So that meant that the names of all elements and attributes were actually members of a global namespace. And so it only follows that when you start mixing data from different systems into a single XML document, naming collisions are virtually unavoidable. So XML namespaces are a very important thing to understand, and I'm going to talk more about them very shortly. After we look at XML namespaces, I will be talking about XML schemas or XSDs for the remainder of this module. So for now, I'll just say that XML schemas give you a way to define data types that you can apply to XML documents. XPath gets its name from use of a path notation for navigating through the structure of an XML document. XPath gives you a way to select specific nodes or values from the document. In general, the BizTalk tools will generate the XPath that you'll need for your applications, but it's still a good idea to understand the syntax. So you might want to take some time to get an understanding of the syntax and you'll find plenty of tutorials available on the web. XSLT gives you a standard way to define rules for transforming the content of one XML document to the format of another XML document. XSLT is pretty complex, but fortunately, the BizTalk toolset can help generate this for you as well.
Then there's the Document Object Model, or the DOM, and that provides a standardized programming interface that you could use to interact with XML documents. BizTalk uses the DOM beneath the surface, but if you ever write a custom component, you might need to access the DOM yourself. And so the .NET framework provides the XML document class that implements the DOM. SOAP originally stood for the Simple Object Access Protocol, but eventually people realized it actually wasn't simple to access objects across disparate systems. And so SOAP's acronym status has been revoked. And now SOAP just serves as the name of the standard that defines the XML envelope that can be used to call web services. SOAP then serves as the basis for a number of other web service standards that define protocols for things such as security and transaction handling and so forth. And then there's WSDL. WSDL, or the Web Service Description Language, builds on the XML, XSD, and SOAP standards. And WSDL provides a way to describe all of the details that a system would need to call a given web service. So WSDL incorporates XSD to define the content of messages, and it allows you to group those messages into operations, and then it allows you to group those operations into interfaces. WSDL also provides a way to define bindings for each interface and protocol combination, along with the endpoint address for each one. WSDL actually plays a crucial role in the underlying architecture of BizTalk, and many of the terms that you will encounter while you're working with BizTalk actually come from WSDL. I mentioned that XML namespaces were introduced to help avoid naming collisions between elements that originate from different sources. Some people find the XML namespace syntax a little bit confusing, so I'd like to step through a sequence of XML documents so you can see how namespaces are applied. In this first document, we don't specify any particular XML namespace. And so an XML parser would interpret that all of these elements are taken from the global namespace. So if you have two different systems that produce a sales report element, but they produce different content within that sales report element, we're going to have a problem. So to apply an XML namespace to this document as a whole, we can use syntax something like this. We are saying that this sales report element belongs to the adventureworks.com sales report namespace. Now that looks like a location that you could plug into your web browser and navigate and find something at that location, but that's not necessarily the case. The idea here is that a namespace just needs to be unique. And so by convention, Developers adopt the URL of their company, which is unique on the internet, and then they just need to make sure that they add a unique path beneath it. So a URL is not required as an XML namespace. You just need to provide a unique string of characters that no one else is going to use, and then you'll be able to avoid name collisions. So in this document, we're saying that the sales report element is part of the AdventureWorks sales report namespace. And we're saying that all of the elements within it, customer sales ID and so forth, are all part of that same namespace. So we've provided a single namespace then that applies to all of the elements in this document. By the way, this namespace does not apply to the attributes. So the ID attribute identifying Fabricam as the customer and the currency attribute are not scoped by this namespace. So you could say that it's implied here that these attributes are scoped by the name of their containing element. There is a way, however, to apply namespaces to attributes, and I'll show you how to do that in a minute. What happens then if we need to start mixing in elements or attributes from another namespace in our document? Maybe the data that we're working with comes from two different systems. Each of those systems might define a set of elements, and each of those systems might qualify its elements with a different namespace. So how do we deal with that fact? Well, the way we can add a second namespace to our document is by defining a namespace prefix that's associated with that new namespace. And that looks like this. So here we have added the adventureworks.com products namespace. And we're saying that any element or attribute that is part of the products namespace will be prefixed with the characters PROD. 
So as it turns out, the elements that describe our widget, the ID and unit sold and price, actually come from the products namespace. And so to indicate that, we add the prefix to each of those element names. And now we've indicated that we're not talking about just any old ID element, and we're not even talking about an ID element that belongs to the sales report namespace. We're specifically talking about the ID element that's defined by the adventureworks.com products namespace. And the same is true for the unit sold and the price elements now. And then, if you also look at the currency attribute, you can see that the prod prefix has been applied to it as well. So now the currency attribute is scoped by the adventureworks.com product namespace. And so the default namespace applies to the document as a whole, but if we define a namespace with a prefix, we can apply that prefix wherever necessary throughout that document. Well, if you have been able to define a schema that describes the content of the message that your application will be working with, you can configure BizTalk to locate that schema as it receives a message. So the scenario shown here, we have a couple of schemas deployed out to the BizTalk environment. A schema is always going to specify the namespace in which its type definitions belong. And so the namespaces for these schemas are new orders and orders update. So in our scenario, we will have configured BizTalk to examine any new message it receives and determine the type of message that it is. And so it will perform the lookup and find the matching schema. It will use the rules of that schema to process the message and then submit it to the message box for further processing. And in the same way, we get a second message and it has the namespace order update. It performs the update and finds the corresponding schema, processes the message, and submits it to the message box. Now if it receives another message, and in this case the message specifies that it's in the inventory namespace, BizTalk is going to try to perform that lookup, and it won't find anything. So it will submit the message to the message box, but it will suspend it in that case. So it's the schemas that provide BizTalk with the initial rules that it needs to process these messages as they arrive. Well, speaking of schemas, what do those look like and how do those work? Well, as you might expect from any experience you have with database schemas, an XML schema is going to specify data types, except these data types apply to XML documents in the elements and attributes that they contain. So let's step through a simple schema here that defines the format of an invoice message. Notice at the top that this schema specifies a target namespace. What that's saying is that all of the elements and attributes and data types that we define within this schema will be part of the contozo.com invoice namespace. You can also see that this document specifies a namespace prefix for the W3C's 2001 XML schema namespace. And that's because this schema document that we're looking at here is a valid XML document, and so it has to follow all the rules of any other XML document. Okay, so an XML schema is always going to have a root element of the name schema. And within that, we can start defining types. Now we need to make a choice here. When our schema is going to start defining new elements, and those elements can have child elements, do we want to require that each of those child elements be included in the invoice namespace as well? If you think about it, it's actually not entirely necessary because if we create an invoice element in this schema, for example, that parent invoice element will already be qualified by the contoso.com invoice namespace. So in that case, all of the child elements, in a sense, are qualified by their parent element's name and their parent element's namespace. And we need to make the same decision for attribute names as well. So you specify the answer to those questions by adding a couple of additional items to your root schema element. So here we're saying that we're not going to worry about namespaces as they pertain to attributes. Attributes are always going to be included within an element so we're going to say that that's sufficient. In the case of element names, on the other hand, 
Here we are saying that every element and all of its child elements must be namespace qualified. So when we create an XML document that conforms to this schema, we either need to provide a default namespace, which will cover all of the elements within it in the document, or we need to define a namespace prefix and apply that prefix to every element within the document. And you'll see it done both ways. All right, so let's move on to the definition of our root element. Now this schema isn't going to attempt to define an entire invoice. We certainly don't have enough space for that on this slide. So this schema will simply define the item element that we can use within an invoice. So the item element is going to contain child elements. And the way we indicate that is that it is a complex type. So by that, we're saying that this item element contains more than just a simple string. We're going to say that this item element contains a sequence of child elements. They need to appear in a particular order. And you can also notice that this schema is specifying the data types for each of these child elements using the simple types defined in the XML schema specification. It's possible, by the way, to take these type definitions even further, and we can start specifying the maximum length of particular strings, and we can specify the minimum and maximum values of different fields. We can even specify a regular expression, and when the parser hits that element, it will take the value that's provided, execute the regular expression, and see if it passes. So there's a lot of flexibility here. If you don't have the need, you don't have to define every little detail of your messages. But if that would help, you have the option to do so. Now BizTalk actually does apply this schema model to different types of messages. So far we've just been focusing on schemas that describe XML documents. So you can see there's a lot of capability there. Now the XML specification defines something known as XML annotations. And so this is extra information that you can provide in a document but it's not really to considered to be the core data of the document. It's just extra descriptive information. And if you pass this document to another system, you're not necessarily expecting that that other system will understand what the annotations mean. So if we use the BizTalk schema editor to create our schema, it gives us the option to add extra information to describe how that schema relates to a flat file format. We can give it positioning information and delimiter information. And if we get all that correct, BizTalk can actually take that flat file. It can use all of the information that we have provided in those annotations. And it can convert that flat file into an XML document. And it can also do the reverse. It can take the XML document and convert it into a flat file. And so now we don't have to require XML from every system that wants to interact with our BizTalk application. If it only knows how to read and write flat files, and we can describe that flat file as a BizTalk schema, our application can process it. And that same capability extends to EDI documents as well. So flat files in general are sort of arbitrary. It depends on the system that you're interacting with. So you might say that EDI documents are flat files, but then those flat files are based on a series of specifications published by a standards body. And the good news is, is that BizTalk already defines the schemas for a large set of those EDI specifications. But they work the same way. They're an XML schema at the core, with annotations that describe the actual formatting of the file itself. It's probably safe to say that in general, flat files conform to a proprietary format of some sort. So you might find yourself dealing with delimited flat files in which a character is used to separate the value of one field from the next. And then another character is used to separate one record from the next. And then there can be a lot of variations on this. Some flat files might have a header. Some flat files might have a header and a footer. In some cases, each record within the flat file might be tagged with a certain value at the beginning. 
Unfortunately, BizTalk's flat file parsing capabilities are prepared to deal with all of that. You might also find yourself dealing with positional files. So each field is allotted a certain number of characters, and then some sort of character terminates the end of the record. And BizTalk can deal with that just as well. It just uses a different type of annotation. And it can actually deal with a combination of these two types of formats. Fortunately, BizTalk provides a set of tools to make it a little easier to work with all of these details. And speaking of tools, let's start taking a look at those. So, of course, in some cases you might be handed a set of schemas, but you might find that you still need to go in and edit those. So BizTalk provides you the schema editor for viewing and editing your schema. But if you have to start from scratch, or if you have some sample data perhaps, BizTalk provides a couple of tools that can help you get started. And then sometimes you might be dealing with a situation in which one schema refers to another schema to pull some type definition information in. And I'll show you how to work with that. Of course, once you come up with a schema, you're going to want to test it. And BizTalk provides you a way to do that. I'll show you how to create and test a simple schema. And then if you're dealing with flat files in particular, I'll show you a tool you can use to read in a sample flat file and use that information to create the schema that defines the format of that flat file. Today it's pretty common that if a system can produce XML and consume XML, it can also produce the schemas that describe those XML documents. But occasionally you will probably still have to create a schema from scratch. And by using the schema editor in Visual Studio, you can start with a blank slate and build your schema from the ground up. Now another situation you might find is that you have access to some schemas that define some of the data types that you'll be using. But you don't have an overall schema that ties everything together in the document format that you will need. So fortunately, if you have to go about creating that new all-encompassing schema, the BizTalk Schema Editor provides a means to import other schemas into the new schema that you're creating. And you have a few different options for how you perform that import. In other cases, you might have some sample data. You might have either an XML file or a flat file that reveals the formatting that you'll need to follow. And BizTalk provides a couple of tools that can help you there. If you happen to have your schema defined in an older format, such as a DTD or an XDR, and neither of those is probably real common these days, but if that is the case, BizTalk provides tools for migrating those to the XML schema format. I mentioned that BizTalk offers a few tools for importing an existing XML document or one of these older definition types such as XDR or DTD. To make use of these tools, you'll need to open or create a BizTalk project in Visual Studio and then choose the option to add a generated item. And when you select that option, BizTalk presents a dialog box, and you can use that to select the type of file that you're providing and the name of the file. And BizTalk will take it from there and produce a set of XSD files, XML schema files, and add those to your project. If it's reading in a well-formed XML document, it really doesn't know much about the data types. But nonetheless, it's a start. You don't have to start by specifying the overall structure of the document. Well, I think it's safe to say that you'll be pretty well acquainted with the BizTalk editor by the end of this course, since the definition of the format of the messages that your application will be dealing with is usually at the core of your application's design. I think you can expect that you'll be spending a fair amount of time using the schema editor, at least in the initial phases. You had a chance to take a quick look at the schema editor in module one, so let's look at that in more detail now. You can see in this screenshot that the schema editor is divided into a couple of windows. On the left side, you will see your schema presented as a tree view. And then you can see each of the attributes and elements that are defined by the schema are represented as nodes in the tree. 
so you can collapse and expand the branches of the tree as you need. And so the tree view just provides a convenient way to access the various nodes in your schema. Now this screenshot doesn't show it, but as you click on each node in the tree, the properties window will display the settings that pertain to that particular node. And so then you can just edit the properties to specify the formatting of that selected node. In the right hand pane of the schema editor, you can see the actual XML schema document. And so even though BizTalk might add extensions for flat files and so forth, you are ultimately just working with an XSD file. And as you need to add elements and attributes to your schema, you can simply right click on one of the existing nodes in the schema and add either child elements to it, or you can add a sibling element, which will be inserted at the same level. It's also possible to add sequence groups and choice groups. A sequence group can be used by a type definition and it just defines a list of elements which need to appear in order. A choice group provides a list of elements, but it specifies that only one of those elements should appear. And in the same sense, you can define an attribute group. You might create these types of things if you're going to use the same group of elements or attributes across multiple type definitions. That way you only have to define them in one place. XML schema also supports the idea of a generic element. It's known as the any element. So if you don't know exactly what's going to be inserted at a particular location, you can insert one of these so-called any elements or any attributes. And that will simply serve as a placeholder, meaning that some content will be inserted there. You just don't know exactly what. As you add and remove nodes from a schema, the XSD view will automatically refresh. And that's usually nice, but if you're working with a large schema, that can slow things down. And so you might want to turn off that auto refresh capability. In those cases, when you just get bits and pieces of schemas and you don't get one schema that ties it all together, you can use the schema editor to create that new schema and then you can reference those schemas to use the data types and the elements that they contain. When you do that, there are a few different options that you have. First, if you want to reference a schema, but it specifies a different target namespace than your schema, you will need to tell the schema editor to import that other schema. These terms, by the way, come from the XML schema specification. So they're nothing that's particular to the schema editor. They originate in the specification. On the other hand, if the schema you're referencing has the same target namespace as the schema you're working with, you would tell the schema editor to include that other schema. And then the third option is you might want to reference another schema, but you don't want to use the type definitions exactly as is. Perhaps you want to add some additional constraints on a type. For example, that schema might define an element that simply has a data type of string, a customer name, for example. But you want to specify that the customer name must be no more than 40 characters. And then you can add those additional constraints to the type definition. In the case of redefine, the target namespace of the reference schema must match the target namespace of the schema that you're working with. So it's similar to the include method, but it gives you the option to make changes to the type definition that you're referencing. As you're creating and editing your schemas and you want to test them along the way, you can take advantage of the features that BizTalk adds for that purpose. In Visual Studio, if you point to your schema file in the Solution Explorer and you right click, you'll see a few different options for working with your schemas. If you click on Generate Instance and then you point to the link and control click on the link, you will see a document that Visual Studio has generated that conforms to your schema. When it displays that document, it will be in a read-only view. So right click on that read-only view 
and choose view source and then you'll be able to edit the XML. And so the data that's provided within the elements and attributes is simply going to contain generated values so they'll be meaningless for the most part but you can go in and alter those values to meet the needs of your test scenario and then you can ask Visual Studio to validate that document using your schema. You'll need to configure a property on your schema to specify the name of the file that Visual Studio should validate. And then you'll need to specify the type of that file. In this case, we're working with an XML file, but you can also validate against flat files and Visual Studio will convert that flat file into XML and then perform the validation on that XML. By the way, if you want to specify the file name that Visual Studio should use when it generates an instance for you, you can configure that property on your schema as well. So once you have the input instance file name configured, you can ask Visual Studio to validate that. And at that point, Visual Studio will compare the contents of your file against the requirements of the schema and flag any discrepancies. And you can use that to make sure you've set the type constraints correctly on your different elements and attributes. Finally, if you get a schema from someone else, or if for whatever reason you had to edit that schema outside of Visual Studio, you probably want to validate that schema. In that case, Visual Studio will take your schema document and compare it against all of the constraints for XML schema documents. And it will let you know, of course, if it finds any errors. And that can be helpful if you receive a large number of schemas from another system. And that will give you a chance to resolve those discrepancies before you start incorporating these schemas into your BizTalk application. In this demonstration, I will show you how to create an XML schema that defines a purchase order. So this purchase order will be an XML document, and we're going to add the elements and attributes that are required. And then I'll show you how to generate an instance of that purchase order document, and then I'll show you how to use that to test the schema. So here we are in Visual Studio. I'm going to start off by adding a schema file to this project. And I can do that by right-clicking on the project and then choosing Add and then choosing New Item. This list shows the types of items that we can add to our BizTalk project, so I'm going to choose Schema. And then I'll name this the Purchase Order Schema. All right, here's our new schema. You can see that the target namespace for this purchase order schema was taken from the project name. We could change that target namespace to anything we like, but that's the default that Visual Studio chooses. So the first thing we need to do is we need to change the name of our root node. So I'm just going to abbreviate this as PO for purchase order. You'll see that the BizTalk schema editor uses the term record when it's talking about an element that can have child nodes, whether those child nodes are attributes or elements themselves. And then it uses the term field element when it's talking about an XML element that cannot have child nodes. So I'm going to choose to add a record to hold our customer information. And you can see that was added to the schema in the center pane. And then I'll add a second record for the address information. And then I'll add one more record for the item collection. Okay, now it's time to add fields to these records. So the customer record is going to contain its fields as XML attributes. So I'll start by adding a field attribute. 
and this one will be for the first name. And then I'll add another field attribute for the last name. And then a field attribute for the email address. And finally, one last field attribute for the phone number. Now the address fields will be stored as elements. So I'll add a field element for the street, and then another field element for the city. and then one for the state. And then zip code. Now the items node is going to contain a collection of individual item records. So I'm going to add a record to represent a single item. And then I'm going to add two field attributes to that item record. One for the SKU and one for the item description. Now there's one other thing we need to do with this item record. And that is that we need to indicate that this element can occur more than once. So there's a property called max occurs, and we can set that to indicate that this item element can repeat. And so if I set that to star, that means it can repeat any number of times. There's no limit. Min occurs defaults to one, but I'll just set it here to be clear. Okay, at this point we're ready to generate an instance of this schema. Before we do that though, I'd like to set a property on the schema file so that Visual Studio will know the file name that it should use when it creates the instance. So I'm going to set the property called output instance file name. Now I can just right click on the purchase order schema and choose generate instance. And you can see the Visual Studio successfully created an instance. And so we'll be able to go find that file beneath the project folder. And there it is, purchase order gen. So here's the file that Visual Studio generated. I had attempted to provide some sample data. The main thing that it did is it set up the structure of the XML file. So that makes it easy for us just to go in and change the values to things that make sense. Okay, now let's test this schema by validating a file. But in order to do that, I am going to set another property. And this time I'm going to provide the input instance file name. So this will be the name of the file that Visual Studio should load to test validation for our schema. All right, once that's set, we can simply right click and then choose Validate Instance. And that succeeded. So we created the schema correctly. It matched our sample data.
Now if you want to see the test data that was used, you can control click on the link that's shown. And there's the sample file that was provided for testing our schema. I mentioned earlier that BizTalk can help you create a schema that specifies the format of a flat file. And that tool is known as the flat file schema wizard. So if you provide some sample data to this tool, it will walk you through the process of specifying all of the formatting information that's required to parse that flat file. So whether it uses positional formatting or character delimiters, it will take you line by line through that file and ask you about the formatting requirements for each field. It takes a little getting used to, but after you've run through it a few times, it all starts to make sense. In this demonstration, I'll show you how to use the flat file wizard. We'll be reading in a text file that represents a purchase order, and then we'll use the wizard to walk through the process of specifying the formatting details. And once that's complete, I'll show you how to validate and test the flat file schema. We can start the flat file schema wizard by adding a new item to our project and then choose flat file schema wizard. So this will be an alternate format for our purchase orders. And here we have the flat file schema wizard. Okay, now the first thing we need to do is we need to provide the name of a file that we can use to serve as our sample data. So there's a text file out in the project folder that provides some sample data. Then we need to set the record name. So this is going to be an order. And notice there's a default target namespace as well, named after the solution and project and schema name. Okay, click Next, and now it's going to present us with the data that it found in the sample file. So here we're indicating which data we want the flat file schema wizard to use as it's walking us through this process. So we're going to start off indicating how the individual records are separated. And we're going to use the delimiter of carriage return line feed. So we're going to select by delimiter symbol and then click next. Okay, so it defaults to carriage return line feed. So the header of our flat file is identified by a tag, the character's PO. So we need to provide that here. And then click next. So based on the information that we've provided so far, the schema wizard has found three items that need further definition, so it's asking us for more information. So we can see that each of these items consists of a record, so we're going to provide the element names for each of those records. And then for each one, we need to indicate that it is a record. So the wizard has started building our schema. So you can see at a high level, we have the three records. And so now we're going to drill into each of those records and define them in further detail. All right, so this first record will be the purchase order detail information. And that is delimited by commas. So we need to select the comma character here. And now the wizard is telling us that it found three items within this record, so we need to define the names of those and their types. 
All right, so with the purchase order detail record complete, now we can move on to the address. So there's the address data, and notice that it's using positional formatting. So we need to indicate that here. And now we need to provide the position information. So it makes it easy for us. We just need to click on this ruler. All right, we've defined the positional information. And now the wizard is indicating the information that it found, and it's asking us to describe it further. Okay, click Next. And now we're down to the items, so we need to define the items record in more detail. All right, so we have some items selected. So item records are delimited with the comma character. And then the collection of item records is identified with the items tag. Now notice that this is case sensitive. So if case doesn't match, it will report that as an error. And now the wizard is indicating that it found two records and it wants more information. So we'll identify this as an, the item record. And we're going to indicate that this is a repeating record. There can be more than one item. But then it still wants to know what to, it should do with the second record that it found. And we can tell it to ignore that one. We'll be able to provide all the information that the wizard will need based on the first record. Now it wants to know the format of each individual item. The fields within an item are delimited with the pipe character. So we need to choose that from the delimiter list and then indicate the tag name. And now we need to provide the detail about each individual field. All right, our flat file schema is complete. So you can see the schema. So if you look, you'll be able to see the annotations that provide the formatting information for the flat file. Okay, let's test this. If you look at the properties, the input instance file name was automatically set for us based on the sample data that we provided to the wizard. So it's the same file name. Now we can use that file to test our flat file, make sure we answered all of the questions correctly in the wizard. So validation succeeded. We can see the name of the input file that was used to test our schema. And then we can also see the XML result. So that's the XML representation of our flat file. Once you have finished editing and testing your schemas, you will need to prepare them for deployment. In the deployment model that BizTalk follows, your schemas must be deployed in assemblies. And so what you need to do is, in Visual Studio, you need to build that assembly, and you simply do that by right-clicking on your BizTalk project name and then clicking Build. And Visual Studio will take it from there. It will compile and create the assembly. If you go looking for it, you'll find it under the bin folder in your Visual Studio project folder.
And as it's adding your schema to the assembly, it will do one final check. And if it finds anything wrong, it will report an error. In this lab, you'll get a chance to create a couple of schemas of your own. You'll start off by creating a new BizTalk project, and then you'll add a couple of schemas to it. The first one will be for an XML document that represents a sales order. And the second one will be for a flat file that represents a sales order. So you'll be using the flat file schema wizard for that. And then at the end, you'll get a chance to generate instances of those schemas.